Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another Wine Shark Wednesday. It is I, your host, the Wine Shark, uh, here to talk to you today about wine FAQs. I hope everybody's doing well out there. We are just getting started in our little bit of winter here. Uh, it's just around the corner, and I have got to say, while fall is my favorite season, I'm not really sure where it's even gone. I, I don't know how that happens in 2020 with being on lockdown and not really doing anything socially and a lot of other stuff, but it has certainly seemed to just pass by. But such is the ticking clock. But anyway, uh, things have been really kind of uh, moving along here, though, Wine Shark, which is good. Uh, we want to say thank you to all of the folks that joined us for the show at Reunion Tower. Uh, it was an excellent live show with Two Penny Beer. We had a lot of fun. We had a great interaction just between Two Penny and I. We had a, we had a lot of fun uh, doing the show for you all. We appreciate all of your questions and participation. We hope you guys had a great time, too. So we'll be doing another show. I don't know if it's a we in this one. The next case, I know I'm doing, I am doing a wine show on the 16th of January. So that is the next date. Tickets will be on sale soon and I will promote them via the usual methods. I'll put some stuff out on Facebook. Uh, it'll be in the newsletter. It'll be on Instagram. It'll be on wineshark.com. Uh, so look for those things there on the calendar, etc. Hope you can join us if you are of a mind to and one of our locals, you know, so those of us who are not necessarily around. But anyway, um, we've got some upcoming stuff. This is theoretically the last Wine Shark Wednesday uh, of the year. I may uh, throw in something on the 30th just kind of as a year in retrospective. I've been thinking about some ideas and tooling with them, but I'm not making any commitments yet, so we'll see. I may just be off to the end of the year for the YouTube channel. Uh, but uh, the Deck the Halls show is on Friday. We're going to talk about uh, wine and the other non-turkey-based holiday meals, etc. We're also going to talk about uh, holiday cocktails, punches, traditional things. We're going to make some mulled wine, wassail, and even a recipe for some really awesome punch. So join us on the Zoom live calls, which are really cool because they're totally interactive. I can see and hear and talk to you, not just listen to your chat, which is cool. Uh, and then we have, after that, so that's the last... That's the last uh, interactive show for the rest of the year. So we're also going to be getting the Patreons to start looking into what the next topics are. So by the next time you see me on here, I should have a list uh, that extends through January and tickets will be on sale for all January event dates. Uh, I think we have some more things coming up with blending. Uh, we're going to pick some other grape topics and we're probably going to just start doing some deep dives into additional countries. Um, we did a little basics on Italy earlier in the year, but I've had some requests for particular regions. So we might basically do a, a two or three wine dive into a specific area, which will be kind of fun. So uh, anyway, let's talk about the topic today. Uh, I was looking through the topic list and really kind of uh, kind of had a befuddled moment about what I wanted to talk about today. But I really realized that we've had a lot of really good questions over the course of the, the show. And not only the course of this, but just the course of uh, the last year. So I wanted to kind of summarize them all, provide you guys with a single spot for some of your most frequently asked questions, kind of a good way to summarize how awesome it has been to speak with you guys for the last, uh, we're going on seven months now. So pretty cool stuff. So the 2020 FAQ list, let's talk about the first part is how should I deal with the most common question? Again, this is probably one of the ones that I get almost all the time. How should I deal with the rest of the wine in this bottle that I didn't finish? Well, um, we're going to do answers and question format in a couple of different ways. Um, not only that, we're going to hear, you know, just my own personal answers. We're going to hear some practical stuff. And we're going to, of course, do some, some silly stuff because that's, you know, that's me. So uh, the answer to the first, the, you know, the, the wine shark answer to your question is you should talk to your therapist about your fear of commitment. If you can't finish a bottle of wine, you're doing it wrong. Uh, but honestly, if you're not trying, if you're trying not to overconsume, or that you just, you know, want to taste a little bit and you don't want to finish a whole bottle in an evening, totally understandable. Happens to the best of us. Uh, but we want to talk through several of your options for how you want to approach that problem. Uh, first off, 
the basic option is to simply recork your wine and refrigerate it. Uh, yes, red wines too, white wine, red wine doesn't matter. Put the cork in it, refrigerate it. That's the that, at a basic level, what you're doing, you're, you're going to at least preserve the wine for a little bit by doing that. Um, better is to use something like a vacuum vent. I think I actually have my vacuum vent around here somewhere, uh, but it is basically a rubber cork with a one-way vacuum seal. It removes air. Less air equals less oxidization. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, the other thing you can do is you can use science. Yes, science. If you if, if vacuuming isn't enough science for you, we can do something else cool. Um, you can use something like this. Uh, this is Private Reserve Wine Restore. What this does is you get your science will be on and you put an inert gas blanket between yourself and the uh, and the wine. And so what that does is that basically keeps the oxygen away from the wine and stops the oxidization problem. So they sell cans of it, stuff like this. You can get an example right there. Um, the other answer to your question is expensive science. And that's this next photo, uh, Coravine. This basically does boast, but though it is likely to trigger your trypanophobia, and that is if you are a fear of needles uh, and a medical procedures with needles, it's a giant needle and a gas canister. And what it does is it goes down through the cork, allows you to pour the wine out of the bottle with, and simultaneously replacing it with inert gas. So you've got science, you've got expensive devices, you've got gadgetry, it's all, well, you know, what could possibly go wrong? Big needles plus science plus big money equals Coravine. Okay, uh, kind of cool when we talk about things like that. So why, by the way, should I go to all this trouble? And the answer is wine reacts with oxygen. From the moment you open up that bottle, it begins to change. And um, because it changes flavor, it generally, it generally, it's speaking at first, this is a good thing. We want the wine to kind of open up its flavors and see that bit of oxygen. It's why we do decanting. It's why your wine will start to taste a little bit better if you leave it in the glass for probably about five, 10 minutes before you just start guzzling. But uh, the problem is that that process can quickly go too far. Oxidization eventually steals the wine's flavor and it doesn't taste as bright or as flavorful anymore. You can get kind of a flat or even a metallic taste to it, which is not fun at all. It just tastes dead. So that is why we go through the trouble of that. I might, like I said, personally here at the house, I use a vacuum bin because it's simple, it's inexpensive, it fits in drawers well, uh, and it's just easy, um, as opposed to cans that I've got to replace and Coravine, which is a big whole device thing, so, okay. Uh, any questions on the chat so far? I want to double check. Hey, everybody says hello. So hello to Dave and Mary. Hello to Barbara and hello to Donna. Hope we're having a good Wednesday for you guys. So um, the next question, there was a great question from uh, an old high school buddy of mine who started watching the channel, uh, my friend Joe. And he asked him, you know, he's uh, today, we did a whole episode on being new to wine, but this is the short form about it. I said, I'm new to wine. Where should I begin my wine journey? Uh, and that's an excellent question because if the wine world is big and kind of scary and kind of complicated if you would believe the traditional hype in media. Uh, one of my whole missions with Wine Shark ever since I started this back in, you know, there's a blog back in 2004, um, has been to simplify, to, uh, to break through that tradition barrier and to, to realize that, you know, wine is a grocery, not a luxury, and it can be part of your everyday life. So um, the first things to look for when you're just trying out, uh, like literally trying to pick a wine to try, my, my gut says the very first thing you should ask is to ask about wines that match existing tastes or flavors you already like. All right, that's probably the most simple by advice I could say. So, you know, if you already like, say, things that taste like cherries, or if you like things that, you know, and most of this is gonna to apply to fruit type flavors, or, you know, I like grapefruit, or I like this, I like that, I like lemons and limes. A lot of those flavors are gonna appear in wines, and that's probably a decent way to start if you don't know anything else uh, other than the flavors you like. But I really think that the next best step is to really just ask about starting on light side of wines, whether they're white wines or red wines, ask about to ask for something that's lighter. Mm -hmm. um, lighter wines tend to be easier to approach for new wine drinkers. They tend to have less overall palate impact. They're not so heavy, not so weighty, and they are a great stepping stone into other grapes now, uh, or other wines rather. Uh, so specifically in the show, in the previous show, I talked about um, our gateway type, a gateway whites like say uh, Riesling, things like on the red side, we talk about Gamay or Pinot Noir. These are lighter style reds and lighter style whites that are really a great entry, at least when we get away from some of these super sweet wines that tend to be part of either youthful interactions with wine or first interactions with wine. So um, 
If you're going to go shopping for wine, um, I always want to remember three things. And um, that is knowing what you already like. Uh, if you can walk into a good wine store and tell them, uh, I like Pinot Noir, I like Cabernet Sauvignon, I like Riesling, I like, you know, Amontillado Sherry, whatever it happens to be. If you know that, that's important because that way you have a baseline that the wine people can work from. Second thing I want you to do is whether you want more of the same or whether you're trying to branch out. Tell the person who's trying to help you out whether you're trying to stick to, I want, I like Pinot Noir, but I want a new Pinot Noir. Or whether I like Pinot Noir, but I, I kind of want to branch out into a different style, a different grape. Or I like Pinot Noirs from France, I want to try other Pinot Noirs from different countries. Okay, so knowing whether you want to stay in the same lane or whether you want to branch out. And then last and most importantly, uh, your budget. You want to be able to say with confidence, hey, I want to spend about 20 bucks because that answer for a Pinot Noir um, is going to change depending on how much it is that you want to spend. So those three questions are great things to be armed with when you're headed in to buy wine and even if you're a brand new to wine drinker. Uh, but my probably most critical advice, the uh, not the simplest, but probably the one that I think that will get you the furthest, is attend a wine tasting course. Um, seriously, give me your attention for an hour uh, and I will not only introduce you to the topic and how to approach wine, but we'll demonstrate and you'll learn together. Um, the best way, in my opinion, for, to teach people about wine is by doing. And there are easy ways to start. And so we'll demonstrate some of those gateway uh, wines. My Wine 101 class, for instance, we kind of go around the spectrum from light white, medium light. So we do sweet white, dry white, full bodied white. We do maybe a rose or a bubbler. Then we'll do a light red, medium red, full bodied red so that you kind of get the whole experience and kind of see where your palate lies and what you like. So honestly, give me a chance and I'll be glad to help you out along that journey. It's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, so then, so let's see, Corvine, Rob is saying Corvine is awesome when you only want a glass. It's true. Uh, that's exactly what it's designed for. Uh, it's very, I think it's great for industry folks as well, only because the price point and gadgetry point is something that I think is not critically conducive to most people's bar setups. I mean, an electric, you know, wine opener as it stands is already kind of a big step for folks. And I don't want one more device that I can't fit in a drawer that I have to find counter space or, or closet space or, you know, cabinet space for. So, you know, the other part is, you know, it's expensive and it runs out of gas. So, you know, what's what are you going to do when you've had all those single glasses, Rob, when you're there alone in the dark with no way to open that bottle? Ask yourself. Anyway. Um, moving right along, the uh, the next question um, is there. I got this one just the other day, from my buddy Scott. Uh, is there a great or good generic shape for wine glass for everyday use? Um, Scott's a beer drinker and approach this where beer also has a lot of different shapes for glasses, just like wine does. Each one kind of for different styles. And he was asking whether there was a good middle ground, common ground from a wine perspective. And I thought this is a great question. Um, I did a topic and you guys can go back. I'll link it in the doobly-doo below as Matt at, uh, as uh, Matt would say. And I will. I talked a whole thing about, about glassware and their purposes. And in that segment, I actually talk about my day use glasses, but here are some good reminders for that. Um, number one, um, remember the key quality factors for glassware. That is, number one, make it practical. Uh, a glass that you won't clean is a glass that you won't use. So if it's machine washable, uh, because that means you'll use it more often, then I highly encourage you to get a format that is dishwasher friendly. Okay. Uh, if you don't, if you don't clean it, you tend not to want to use it because it becomes a pain in your ass and therefore you'll, you'll avoid using it. Um, the other thing you want is the thinness of glass. The thinner the glass, the more consistent and better the taste experience becomes. This, by the way, is the advantage of most crystal glassware. But uh, modern gla grass glass crystal hybrids or titanium crystal, like my Schatz Fiesel glasses that I use, are an excellent choice for thinness and durability and machine safe washing. Um, although I do not wash mine in the in the in the machine simply because they are thin and I've broken them, I I do hand wash them, but that's me. Um, you know, I this is something that I do all the time, so it's part of my routine. If you don't like hand washing glassware, if it whether it's intimidating or just you know not worth your time, 
then I would recommend something that's a little thicker and something that fits in your dishwasher. Um, Size-wise, shape-wise, uh, a decently large glass can accommodate most wines with not doing any harm, um, save for maybe bubbly wines, okay? So this is the glass, the, the glass style that I use um, for my Schatz Fiesel glasses that you'll see me use here on the show all the time. Now, a word about this glass. So this is the kind of a Cabernet style or Pinot Noir style glass. It's tall, a lot of air capture, so you catch aromas. It's thin, it's durable, so, you know, it's got titanium glass crystal. Um, and as you'll see in these, but what, what the, the thing I want you to be aware of is the size thing. Uh, this is an 18 and a half ounce glass, and this is about a three ounce pour. So the, the size, you don't underestimate the size glass that you need. You're going to look at some of these and you're going to be like, my God, that's huge. I mean, 18 and a half ounces is two thirds of a bottle. You know, you're looking at that going, man, that's, you know, that seems like an awful lot. Well, yeah, because a lot of that's going to be airspace. Um, for a standard four to six ounce pour, depending on how, how thirsty you are, a large glass like this will give you the benefit of all that airspace, which traps aroma and helps you smell that delightful wine. So uh, that's my, my advice on size is get something that's a little bit larger uh, that then you expect to be drinking. Okay. So uh, next question. If I don't have a wine cellar, how should I store my wine? The answer is, well, think of the, remember these following qualities about wine storage. You want dark, cool, or at least temperature consistent place away from vibration odor. So light, temperature control, odor resistant, and vibration resistant. So dark, why does that matter? Um, light damages wine, especially UV and sunlight. Uh, they can damage a wine in as few uh, as a few a little time as a few hours. So we absolutely want to keep our light our wine out of the sun and darkness in general is just better. Now, by the way, when we're talking about storage here, I'm talking about non-collector level storage. Uh, for instance, if, you, if, you're, if you're a collector, you're obviously going to get a wine cellar. If you're going to lay things down for long periods of time, let's say five years or more, you're going to want to invest in a cellar or a place to store your wine professionally, not just throw it in your closet. Okay, that do the wine that you're that you're trying to age justice. But if you're just an, you know, you're just a daily wine drinker and you're just you want to have things on hand, but you're not necessarily trying to keep it for a generation. Well, the answer here is, you know, a cool, dark place is going to be awesome. Now, cool. When I say that temperature consistency is likely more important than uh, than specific temperature. 53 degrees and like 80 degree, 80% 80 humidity is the normal long-term storage ideal for many wine uh, connoisseurs. Uh, but if you don't have a place in your house that's 53 degrees and 80% 80, 80 humidity, and I certainly hope you don't, um, then you're going to want to just choose a place like an interior closet that doesn't fluctuate with the cooler or, or warmer outside temperatures of your home. Uh, anything that stays consistently 75 degrees is better than something that's, that, that's say 30 in the winter and 85 in the summer. Okay, that, that type of fluctuation will kill your wine. So we don't wanna do that. Just be consistent. So interior closet, away from facing from windows, et cetera, is usually a good choice. Uh, vibration, now this one's pretty rare. Uh, if you live near train tracks, vibration doesn't let wine rest for a long time. But again, we're not talking long-term storage for you here. But generally speaking, if you live near train tracks, you're not gonna to wanna to store your wine on premises. Um, but a really important one is odor. Okay, odor is, uh, cork is porous, and if your wine is cork in it, it can allow odors in as much as it's doing off-gassing during, uh, during the aging process. So things like mothballs, chemical storage, cleaners, bleaches, soaps, key, you know, you don't want to store something, for instance, above the, uh, above your washer dryer just because it's convenient, because you're going to open up that wine that's going to taste like your Clorox, and that's not a fun experience. So uh, keep your, keep odor away from where you store your wine, whether it be just a neutral sort of sort of place. So, okay, um, I also get this one a lot. This is another my, my, kind of my last of my big FAQs, and that is, what's your favorite wine? And that's usually a, a kind of a personal uh, question. And, and what it generally is, is it's uh, an attempt for, for, for a student or a guest to understand where my wine world lies. Uh, either that or it's a, it's a 
it's a it's a gotcha question from people who are asking about you know whether I can name something expensive that they've heard of or something shit like that, which I don't particularly cotton to. So the real answer is, uh, I mean, so here's the, you know, the humorous answer we can go through. We've got a whole line of these. We, I like my line, wine like I like my women. Uh, I like my wine like I like my women. Bold, smooth, and juicy. Uh, no. Uh, how about a 14% alcohol or higher? Uh, no. Sweet, thick, and for dessert? No. How about older, complicated, and too expensive for my tastes? Yeah, any one of those. But still, uh, to be honest with you, the wine in front of me is my favorite wine. Uh, I have a broad appreciation for the world of wine that I live in and for the appropriate occasion that I'm aiming for. So uh, almost all the styles of wine that I've encountered in my wine career, I enjoy in one way or another. There may not be my go my go to day to day thing, which that, by the way, might be the intent of the question. Like, what types of wines do you drink on a daily basis is actually a better question for me than what's my favorite wine. Uh, so uh, each wine has its own place and purpose, right? There's all kinds of use for every for every wine out there whether it's a dessert wine whether it's a a big bold red whether it's a light sweet white whether it's a bubbly from italy it doesn't you know each one of those things has a different place in time and you guys know that i'm a big fan of analogies and so my favorite one for this is music because the answer there is you know what are you in the mood for right now what's the most appropriate for this situation is this a a mozart moment or a Katy perry moment is this a moment like where we really i want something complicated like rush or I want something sassy like Tom Jones. You know, do, what mood am I trying to set and what is the occasion is probably the most important question when it comes to what's my favorite. Um, now, to go back to that alternate question, what types of things do I, you know, uh, do I drink on a daily basis or, uh, you know, on a common basis? Or the other one that I also get sometimes is people post it as the, you know, if you only had one grape to take with you to a desert island you know the your, your desert island wine as it's for, as referred to or whatever that might be um then i can answer those questions a little bit more accurately um when it comes to the desert island i'm kind of in a struggle between um i really like syrah based wines but i'm a huge cab franc fan um you know zinfandel would be hard to leave behind i'd be really hard pressed to choose just one for versatility's sake though that's the part where to be honest with you i think something like like a syrah it has a lot of has a lot of versatility and style um say, same thing with cabernet franc depending on how desert my island was but when it comes to day in day out the stuff that i keep on hand all the time i always keep uh, a bottle of cab a bottle of zen a bottle of chenin blanc a bottle of riesling those are kind of my go-to hangarounds for most purposes. Usually a gamay as well. I keep a Beaujolais on hand at almost all times because it's a it's a just a it's a, such a great middle of the road crowd pleaser. So um, a nice in fact, Morgon happens to be my particular favorite. Uh, but you know those are the types of wines that I keep on hand if I just wanted to say, hey, I've got stuff for any day in day out use um occasionally occasionally I'm, I, i'll dig a really soft chardonnay and so i'll get a, a yen when i shop at the store and i'll stock up on a couple bottles of those and keep them around as well so again it all depends on mood and timing and and everything else so that's the kind of last faq that i wanted to touch through which was in your wine world you know how do you uh prepare for slash you know, and navigate your way through the absolute rainbow of wine that exists out there and to encourage you to not worry so much. <laughs> uh, but first off, don't worry so much what everybody else is drinking, what everybody else is saying. Um, you know, as I've said before, my, my least favorite words in the wine world are I only drink. Okay. That is, that to me shows an extraordinarily narrow point of view. And honestly, I think you're missing a lot of what wine has to offer. Second thing is, don't get hooked by, by the next scale down from that, don't get hooked into habits. Since starting this show and doing the show professionally, I am wonderfully exposed to a lot of different wines uh, on a really regular basis, which is really something I had to work at even as a wine professional as my side hustle before, because I would find myself in those regular ruts. I'd buy those five or six bottles or styles that I'd like, and I wasn't experimenting more often. I had to actively work to make sure that I was going out of my way to find something new and to try something different, even if it was the same 
type of grape that I was interested in or same region I was interested in, I wanted to make sure I tried a new label, right? And so fine, I like Zinfandel, great. Try a Zinfandel you've never tried before. So that I want you, something I want you to be, when you start your wine journey and you become more comfortable with where you, what you like, you should actively seek to find new things because there's so much amazing stuff out there. I would say that as many times as you're going to be disappointed, you're going to be happy 10 times more often. And you're going to find new things that are like, wow, this is great. Uh, so again, another another great segue for you to say, come to our tastings and the shows. You're going to get exposed to a lot of different wine and find new things all the time. So that open-mindedness is, is probably the most key factor in exploring and expanding your wine world. Uh, then the last part, when we've talked about trends and stuff before, I wanted to drop in another note saying, you know, don't be subject to the hype. There's a ton of it out there. There are, as we've talked about, there are so many thousands of wineries that are trying to sell you something. And that's cool. I'm not against them selling you their wine. But on the other hand, a lot of what they say is in their interest, not in your interest, not in your best interest as a wine drinker, not in your best interest as a consumer. So have a healthy degree of skepticism. Don't believe all the hype. Don't get caught behind the latest wine trend and whatever. And, you know, especially because when those things start to happen, I almost guarantee you you're overpaying for your wines. Um we use an example that we've talked about the show before, the wine Mayomi, right? It used to be a great go-to 18 to $20 Pinot Noir. They're wanting 30 bucks for that crap now. And by the way, when I say crap, I mean they got bought by somebody else. They're doing a slightly different process. They're not, they don't have the original winemakers at the helm. It's not as the same wine. And therefore, the is it worth that extra 10 bucks a bottle just because people found out about it? I mean, not to be hipster and be like, I liked it before it was cool. But the reality was it was a grocery store wine that isn't needing to be elevated at that extra level. It's not a, a special player at the $30 table. It's just an overpriced version of that. So don't be that guy. Don't follow those things. So Anyway, uh, questions in the chat. Anybody here? Okay, I'm going to go back over the chat now that I can see you guys. Rob said that he sobs quietly, which is nice. So, and, and, and yes, Rob had the literal same example as I did. My favorite wine is the one in front of me. So that is good. Uh, David and Mary said, we are loving the Advent calendar. Oh, well, excellent. Thank you for the shout out for David and Mary. For those that uh, may not know, oh, I, had a, I have a Wine Shark Advent calendar that I produced, published, which is basically just a list of different styles of wine. It was inspired by Wine Folly, who I'm a huge fan of. They're doing a whole wine journey thing that's much more detailed than what I've got. But what I did is basically just pick 24 awesome wines uh, that are at different styles and, and different uh, regions that really kind of give you a nice open up your eyes snapshot into wine. So thank you. I hope that's a uh, thank you for the shout out for you guys and hope you guys are enjoying it. Uh, Barbara says that trying a new vendor from Carnero. So oh, nice from the little sheeps, the little blah, blah, blah. Uh, and from Frank Family Vineyard. See, that's that right there is exactly the thing, right? Even if you know the area of the region, it's it's trying out those new vineyards, vineyards, trying out new wine makers. Um, as I, if you guys may have heard this before from, from me as well, is that Winemaker is probably one of the best links I think you can find uh, in the same music analogy. When you find uh, a person who makes music or let's even use movies, let's switch it up, right? Um, if you like Steven Spielberg's movies, you're probably going to like pretty much most of the stuff he does. Not all the time, but most. And I think winemakers are very similar because they are artists and decision makers. They have a lot of control over their product. If you find a winemaker who you really admire, you can go seek out their wines. And by trying new things, adjacencies, that's how you'll discover those new winemakers. That's how you get that opportunity. So bravo for Barbara on, on checking out new Carnero Chardonnay. I mean, there's just a great, sun, great, great bunch of them out there. So, you know, awesome. Good stuff. Uh, David Mary also said, David's been researching and planning different menus from our usual fare to go with the Advent Calendar wines. Oh, that's really cool. So that's an opportunity as well when you find a wine that is new to you or, you know, is you're getting exposed to for the first time. Great opportunity to go do a little internet searching, find out what, you know, what flavors you're expecting and some planning. And since I know uh, in, in your house, I know David does all the, does the cooking. So if David is, a, is in charge of the chef's helm, then I think he's going to provide excellent advice on both wine and food pairing. So that is a definite dinner choice, I think, for that. So yeah, uh, so that's kind of, you know, just our FAQ. And, and while some of these questions are going to keep getting asked and probably keep getting covered here, I don't think we can really do them 
uh, you know, do them overdone. We can't, we can't do them too many times because as new people come to me all the time, there's a reason that these are frequently asked questions that even, uh, even experienced wine drinkers will sometimes come and ask the exact same thing. So don't hesitate to ask the, you know, there are stupid questions, but these aren't those. So, uh, anyway, so grocery store grab. Ah, for the, the, the next segment of our show is the grocery store grab, which is, uh, for those that have not seen this before, is the to help get your best value per dollar at for wines that are not found at big box retailers or specialty stores. Uh, some folks don't have the opportunity to have a great wine store or have a big box retailer like, say, Total Wine, Siegel, Specs, something like that, goody goody. Um, and if you do either, if you lack that or out of convenience, for instance, you just shop at your local grocery store. It's an interesting. Um, landscape to navigate. Prices can be very deceptive and also you're exposed to a very interesting band of wine. So we want to talk about and look at labeling for wine because labeling is how we get through uh, and we reward wineries that use good labeling to tell us what's in their bottle and not just use marketing and hype to try and sell us their wine. Okay. Um, sometimes, by the way, we also try those out because we need to know. So anyway, I am your experimenter. These wines are chosen without prior research. I just go to the, when I go to my grocery store, I, I go with an eyeball towards trying stuff. I do my label looks and see what we got. So this week's grocery store grab is the Settle Saint-Michel Merlot from Columbia Valley. Uh, an interesting little front label here, not the Chateau itself. That's pretty standard fare. Um, this is kind of a pseudo French label in its orientation, kind of pseudo Bordeaux like where you'll see of the largest text will be towards the the creator of the wine. Um, the difference here, of course, is the fact that they list the grape, which is not a very Bordeaux thing um, than where it's from. But the one thing that caught my attention on the front of this was it says it's 100 percent vinifera rootstock. Uh, now, that's an interesting kind of level two wine piece of knowledge for the average wine consumer. That's not going to mean, mean much for those in the know. Vitus vinifera is the common wine grape. Most of the grapes in the world that are used to make wine are of this species. But rootstock of varying types can be used to help control various viticultural challenges depending on where you are in the world. Everything from pest control to soil suitability. Uh, there are hybrids out there where you might have the rootstock of something that is more resilient to, say, American soil and pest problems, like the Vitus lentbrusca, the fox grape, or perhaps the Vitus rutifunda. Uh, and what they're declaring here, for whatever reason, is that they have 100% Vitus vinifera rootstock. So, go them. Uh, bravo, or something. I'm, I, that is interesting, because again, that, 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 that's that very idea of, it's 100%, it must be better, because it's 100% of this. So whatevs. Uh, but let's take a look at the back of the bottle here, right? The front of the bottle is, is kind of our typical, you know, we, 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 it's your catch your attentions type mode. It's on the back of the bottle where people start really kind of digging into the what parts that matter. So on the back, it repeats the information from the front. It's after Michelle Merlot from Cabernet Sauvignon from, or sorry, Merlot from the Columbia Valley 2017. But the marketing text is fairly limited. So let's take a look at their paragraph. Armelo is sourced from world-class vineyards of Columbia Valley with new world fruit intensity and elegant old world style. Classic barrel aging and wine making techniques reveal bold yet supple flavors and announce aromas, or sorry, and flavors and aromas of dark red fruits and spice. So kind of limited on their flavor words here. What we're looking for is what's in the bottle. Well, okay, we've got that. It's Merlot. That's good. Where are the grapes grown? Columbia Valley. This is good. The more specific, of course, the better. But Columbia Valley, good spot. We know where that is in the world. Um, and we should be able to relate, if we know anything about this, what that should taste like. Uh, so what does the wine taste like is the other part we're looking for. Flavor words and specific flavor words are to be commended. Where And even better, if you really want to go above and beyond, specific pairings of food would be great as well, as opposed to generic ones. Now, as we've gone through the wine, the, the journey here, um, I'm probably going to remove that for 2021 and just use it as an asterisk of a star that they get a plus if so, because very few wine labels these days are actually giving uh, food pairing suggestions. And I think that's because they're afraid of giving either A, something too broad or B, 
they are worried that if you, you that if you don't like that thing or you don't try it with that thing, you might be turned away because it's too specific. So sadly, but truly, we're not going to see a lot of wine pair or wine and food pairing stuff on wine labels. Plus, apparently, there's a dearth of ink in the world. They always seem to be want to be the most brief. For instance, why would you repeat the exact same things on the back, like Chateau Chen Michel Merlot Columbia Valley 2017, when it's on the front? Or at least, why would you put it in this such a large text? I mean, one third of the back label from here up is all that same information. So, yeah. Anyway, this is Aromas of Dark Red Fruits and Spice. Well, that's almost there. Boy, go, boy, howdy. I mean, dark red fruits? Cool. What does that bring to mind in our brain? Um, I'm thinking about things like cranberries. I'm thinking about pomegranate. I'm thinking about... Um, I uh, mean, red, black raspberry, maybe. Uh, so those are, you know, red plum. Those are examples of dark red fruits that come to mind. But is that exactly what I'm going to find in the glass? Now, it's a sommelier knowing it's Merlot and going, uh, no. And in fact, while you're having red fruits in your Merlot is also less than normal. Uh, normally, we aim at blue and black fruits when we talk about Merlot. But okay, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Spice. Oh, really? What kind of spice? Oh, marjoram, mace, you know, maybe what a pepper. What am I looking for here? What kind of spice is spice? This is an example where this name is all over the place. Satya Michel is a very credible winery. I really enjoy their products. Do not take any of what I'm saying as I don't like what they do. However, I want to give them a, a little piece of advice and then the, of my who cares self and uh, say, hey, you could do a lot better on the wine labeling here. You could tell people a little bit more about your wine, and I think you'd probably sell more wine for those that are bothering to read. Because right now, you're basically standing on your name to sell your wine. And while they are the largest winemaker in Washington State, that's not a good way to grow share, as we would say in the business industry. So here is, uh, let's, then let's talk about the tastes, right? So we always do a little tasting here. We're going to talk about, uh, is this wine well executed? Is it on style? And is it worth the price tag? This, by the way, was a $11 bottle of wine. It was $16 before uh, the store discount, but that's a normal thing that I see in our Texas wine. Our, our club membership style grocery stores, they, they show an inflated price as the, as the non-club price, and then the actual price is the club one. So if you're willing to give them their marketing information, you only have to pay about 11 bucks. So this is a 10 to $15 Merlot. That's what we should be expecting. So uh, let's talk about tasting. Get a little guys going here. Color wise, uh, the color is very dark garnet, and if not, all, if not almost down to ruby. So this is again not showing. It, it is it's a it's mostly clear, although it's got it's got a uh, it's got a good degree of density uh, at the at the deepest part of the wine where you can almost not see through it. Um, so this doesn't necessarily speak to being a light bodied wine. When I smell, I disagree with their red fruit thing completely. What I'm getting here is boysenberry, blackberry, maybe very ripe blue plum, but we're not, uh, you know, even, even almost a heady sense of like a boysenberry or, or blueberry syrup, right? So there's some blue fruits in here. That to me, by the way, is exactly what I would expect out of Merlot as a sommelier. But if you were not a sommelier or you were just brand new to your wine journey and you said, oh, Merlot tastes like dark red fruits. I'm like, no, there's no pomegranate. There's no cranberry, there's no raspberry. This is actually darker in the fruit spectrum. So dark fruits, yes. Red is not the color, though. Okay, so a little deceptive there. Now, spin it around, take a sip. Okay. On the palate, it lightens up from its nose a little bit. Now we get much more of that flesh, fresh blackberry and a little bit more on fresh plum than the boysenberry syrup or blueberry syrup line that I smelled. That, by the way, that syrup line sometimes comes with that uh, idea of reducing reductive flavors, which can be a negative, but it, in this case, it's not. It just smells like it, it's the difference in discussing fresh fruit versus processed and you know cooked fruits. So, with that, it does have a brightness to it. Um, this is still not in the rain, rain realm of red fruits by any stretch, but it doesn't taste like syrup, etc. It tastes more like fresh plums and fresh, fresh blackberries, fresh blueberries. 
It's really quite nice. Uh, by the way, it carries that little bit of spice, and the spice they're intending here is baking spice. I think this is kind of comes along. That's that cinnamon, vanilla kind of line that you'll often get from oak aging. If it is indeed new world, new world fruit intensity, which it has, with old world style, which it doesn't because it doesn't have a whole ton of terroir here, but the oak aging that normally comes in big red wines like this, that's where you get that oak. Oak brings vanilla uh, and caramel and uh, baking spice profiles to, to an extent. Uh, so can certain types of uh, fermentation. But basically, that baking spice thing to me comes across as kind of a vanilla cinnamon wine. And it's right there in the back of the mouth. It kind of lingers around. Uh, the finish on this isn't particularly long. It just kind of lingers for a little bit. But it's nice. Uh, again, this is easily very drinkable. Um, delightful wine. I just think that they're underselling their product on their on their own label. They're not trying hard enough to get you to drink this. They're going, oh, it's Chateau Saint Michel. Of course, I'll drink it. Well, not everybody knows who the hell you are. So, pull your heads out, marketing department. Make better labels. Do do better. Do more. So, is it well executed? Absolutely. This is a great little Merlot. This is a nice, easy drinking. What people get excited about in the world of Merlot. Merlot is kind of one of the most beige grapes out there when it comes to the way people think about it. Um, and we've even talked about the Merlot phenomenon that came along in the uh, late 1990s and early 2000s. But I'll just say this, it is a very different uh, wine than its, that its predecessors from that area. And Merlot is something that Washington State does well. It's one of the reasons I chose to set this, this Merlot is I wanted to go to Washington for Merlot and let you guys experience what that's like. So great place for Merlot, really approachable, very, very well executed. Is it on style? 100%. This taste, it's got the right types of fruit. It's got the right types of profile and it's easy drinking. This is a the lighter end of the Merlot scale compared to the Bordeaux style, which can get a little bit heavier with their blends. But this is awesome drinking, great fun. Is it worth the price tag? 100%. For 11 bucks, this thing is killing it. I would drink this easily day in, day out and offer it to your friends so long as they don't have a Merlot chip on their shoulder. If they do have a Merlot ship on your shoulder, you're allowed to send them to me for verbal beatings because hiding Merlot is dumb. It's a great grape that does a lot of things well. You just got to get away from the hype and learn what to look for. And Washington State, specifically, Chateau Saint Michel, some great place to look for it. So we catch back over to chat here now that I'm done with my rant. Um, let's see. Uh, so, blah, 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 we got to figure out where we were. Oh, so coincidentally, David had already chosen the Indian Wells Merlot from a calendar list to go with broccoli and cheese soup, hot ham, and provolone cheese sandwiches. Nicely done. Now, Indian Wells Merlot, for those listening, uh, that's basically a single vineyard location example of their Merlot. So, as we go from Columbia Valley, which is a broad-scale area, a large AVA, this is Laszlo, who's decided to say hi. It's not showtime, end time. You're supposed to come up at the end of the show. I know. Okay. Anyway, so uh, broad area, Columbia Valley AVA, sub-region Indian Wells, that's where you're talking about the Indian Wells version. So it's a more specific and generally more prestigious and more flavor-specific area. So uh, it's usually also a little bit more expensive, but awesome. I've had that Indian Wells Merlot. It is some good damn juice. So highly, highly well chosen. Oh, no, did we, did we lose that hair? Okay, there we go. Well, anyway, so let's see what's a... Uh, Rob says he's having leftovers tonight. The frogs leaves in killing it great little producer out of napa napa valley california frog's leap which again is one of the, the leap series of wines which have nothing to do with one another but there's stag's leap there's frog's leap i've always joked that slug's leap would be a great uh moniker for a wine produced down near santa cruz for those that are familiar with california flora and fauna the banana slug is a sight to behold leaping banana slugs would be a real sight to behold so anyway, uh, so let's see. Uh, Rob also said they paired with a hearty beef stew. Oh, excellent. That is, see, that you're, you're doing it right there, Rob, I think, with Zin. Zin, it could easily go all the way up to that, you know, nice beefy stew level. It is definitely the weather here for that, you know, cozy inside weather. Although it wasn't rainy today, it was uh, certainly still nice and chilly and the end of fall here in Texas. So, um so yeah, so so Barbara says that she's gonna get each night. You cooked all afternoon for a friend who's having surgery tomorrow. Well, that's awesome. Very bravo in these times because boy, let me tell you, uh, we've all been going through a very rough year that is nearby drawing to a close, and it is only by our neighbors, friends, and wine drinking friends, especially, uh, 
that we're going to get through this all together. You know, community is all where it's at. And I encourage each of you to have that kind of kindness in your hearts and help out those neighbors. Whether they're having surgery or not, uh, cooking for someone is an ultimate act of love if you ask this a white shark. So, uh, David Mary said the menu was actually tagged for the Vouvray, but the Merlot should work too. Well, that's Vouvray's. And again, I think uh, you've made a good point there, uh, David, that, you know, you kiss a couple of... Uh, Vouvray is a definite multi-tool, and the Indian Wells Merlot is still... You know, you're not you're not slamming down overly tannic anything. So I think with your cheese and ham, you're going to win. So anyway, so that's uh that's kind of our summary for our grocery store grab. If you guys have any additional questions about that, happy to answer. Um, while I wait for those in the stream to catch up, let me talk a little bit about what's coming soon. Uh, we've got Deck the Halls on Friday. So Deck the Halls show, the last uh, uh, interactive show in December before I go on break, will be a focus on entertainment of the holidays, but not like we did for Thanksgiving. Instead of more of the, we're going to talk a little bit more about party. We're going to talk about non-turkey-based feasting, so stuff that goes with beef. Um, we've got some brown Cabernet, which I believe is totally awesome. That's going to be uh, some... Some more Washington Stella All Stars, by the way. There, I've been kind of moving in this year. I've been really trying to expand my Washington palette. So, Brown Sellers has done it for us once before. We're going to try them again. Then uh, we're also going to talk about traditional uh, holiday cocktails slash uh, punches and wine preparation. So we're going to do mold wine. We're going to do uh, some killer punch from you guys know my one of my favorite bartenders in the world, Jeffrey Morgenthaler. It's a re it's a recipe from him, who's actually an adaptation from another friend of his. But uh, we're going to get your tequila and your punch and make some awesome times there. So deck the hall should be a lot of fun, very relaxed. It's going to be a great time. I hope you guys can join us on Friday at 7 to about 8.30. So 7 to 8.30, 9 o'clock, depending on how wild we get. Uh, then this is the final Wine Shark Wednesday show, as I said, although I may do a show on the 30th, which is more of a 2020 retrospective, a Wine Shark chit-chat. Um, I may even do some fun reading from some of my favorite wine books. Um, just some general thoughts. I've been kind of coalescing in and about this project, how it's gone, and I wanted to say, you know, thanks to everybody who's been so supportive and such. So uh, there'll be some, it'll be, it'll be interesting. We'll see. Uh, we'll see how well motivated I stay over the break, but I'm betting that I'm going to be dying for your attention by the 30th, so you know how it goes. Um, also, we're going to be a, doing a Patreon poll for upcoming topics. Um, uh, there are no current, after this Friday show, there are no current tickets on sale. I need to remedy that. I want to get you guys into the January schedule, get you guys a chance to get your wines and prepare in advance. So the Patreons that support us uh, get the choice of voting on what order the wine topics come in. So I've got some ideas on there. I'll probably throw in uh, 15, 16 different ideas and let you guys choose the order, which should get us set up for the next couple of months. So... That's how these topics on Fridays come to you, whether it's the uh, wine and cheese show comes every month, but and then any other other topics that we talk about, whether it's deep dive to locations, wine styles, whatever. Um, we've still got a couple more episodes of the Will It Blend. We've got parts two, at least parts two, three, and four, where we go over Bordeaux blends and their cousins from Napa. Then we're going to go to the new style red blends from California and kind of what I would call the, the new grocery store style that's being approached. And uh, we absolutely cannot skip uh, anything in regarding the, the, the rest of the blending world. So I'm going to probably kind of pick up some of the some of the also rands from around the world because uh, we're going to definitely dive into it Italy. Right. And so we're going to do the Italian Sangiovese blends at a minimum. Um, they don't have any imitators that I know of. So that might just be a mixed blending show from two or three different areas. So we'll see. Looking forward to all those topics still love to hear your feedback on those. Uh, and of course, launching the new products that I've been bragging about and have been still in development because I cannot seem to get a happy result with some of the stuff I'm doing. But uh, that includes wine lists that are summary wine lists for all of the wines we've been tasting with all the tasting notes consolidated. And then a more regular recipe push uh, for some of our foodies that are out there on, on Patreon as well. That's something I want to do as well. So, so we're going to prime rib for Christmas. Going to love that. Absolutely a great opportunity. See, prime rib, Christmas time. We're going to talk about those wines on Deck the Halls. Perfect timing, I say. 
that and also when I was shopping for a show the other, for the show at the tower the other day, um, they had they had a, a rack of lamb all dressed up like you'd see in a old Tom and Jerry cartoon. You know, they actually put the little puff white things on the end. You know, puff white uh, uh, little paper paper doodads on the top of the French cut rack of lamb, which is well pretty darn cool if you ask me, because that's fancy when you stick stuff on the end of the bones of your ball and bow. Yes. Uh, anyway, all right. Well, uh, any other questions for everybody? I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to catch up. I know that the stream is ahead of you. I'm definitely going to pour myself another glass of this Sato San Michel because I'm having cheese and leftover cheese and wine for dinner because I'm an adult and I can do that. And I know that none of you will disapprove. Nobody ain't looking at me going, that boy needs to eat more. No, we got this just fine. Especially because the, the dogs, I think that's why Laszlo is highly interested because there's the remainder of some cheese scraps that he has not been privy to sitting beside me at the desk. So, go figure, my dog. The other one's also giving me eyeballs. Anyway, all right, well, if no further questions, guys, I'm going to bid you all adieu. I hope to see you guys on Friday. January 16th at the Tower, and maybe uh, just look for an uh, announcement on Facebook or uh, lead in on the channel, and uh, we will see about maybe seeing you on the 30th right before we close out 2020. Because we all know that uh, this has been a long, hard one. We'll be ready to put it behind us. And while I don't believe that the calendar changes as much as we think it might, I just know this. It's going to be a better year for the rest of us. We're going to be out of this pandemic together. We're going to have a great time. We're going to learn a lot about more wines. This wine journey has just begun, and it is thanks to you that I have the opportunity. So uh, if you guys hit the comments after the show, uh, once we get the wine thing posted up, what is your FAQ on wine? What's the thing that people ask you uh, that either you have a good answer for or maybe even not so much? Let me know in the comments on the video after the, after the publish. Um, if you like what we're doing, like and subscribe to the channel. Share with a wine-loving friend. And if you really like what we're doing, support us over on Patreon. You get extra benefits, including uh, all the access to the library of all paid shows, including written tasting and show notes. Uh, you get all kinds of discounts and cool things. So, uh, and exclusive, and you also get first access to tickets that are special things like the tours. So, if you like what we're doing, check us out over there. And until next time, I have been your wine shark. Cheers. Hey, wait a minute, it's Joe. Well, see, you missed the per first part of the show where we even gave you credit for asking one of the FAQs, Joe. But now you get to be featured in the I haven't shut off the live stream part of the show yet. So, bravo, I miss you. Hope you're doing well up there in uh, down in Tennessee, not in Nashville. So, all right, guys, take care.